Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday online service. I'm so glad that you're able to join us today. And I hope that you enjoyed our worship sessions, and I hope if you have children that they enjoyed Life Kids as well. I want to say a huge thank you to the teams who were part of putting that together for us. We could not do this without you guys. And hey, it's never been easier than it is today to invite a friend to church. So if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching on Facebook, I want to encourage you to share this video with your friends. Tag them into the comments, start a watch party or send them a link and invite them to experience what it's like to be part of this incredible community we have here at Life Church. And speaking of our incredible community, I want to take just a few minutes to remind you of a few ways you can stay connected to it during this time. Firstly, I want to remind you about our life groups, which are the best place to stay connected to everything that we're doing during this period. You can join a life group if you're not yet in one by emailing us at office at life-church.co.uk and we will get you connected with an incredible group of people who will welcome you into their community. Secondly, I want to remind you about our Streams of Hope, which are taking place Monday to Saturday at 11 a.m. every day on Facebook and YouTube. And we would love for you to share these videos with your friends as well, because they are a great way to connect people with a message of hope during this period of time where other voices are sharing bad news. We want to share the message of hope. We want to share the message of faith. We want to share the message of love. So again, invite you to share that message with your friends so that they can experience what it's like to be part of a different story. And I also want to take this opportunity to remind you again that we do have a pastoral phone line which is open to anybody, whether you're in the church or not. You can call that between Monday and Friday, 12 to 2 p.m. on 01522 694 694. And whether it's for a specific need, a prayer request, or whether you just want to hear somebody different voice, you can call us and we will be happy to speak to you. We'd love to speak with you. So give us a call if you'd like to chat. I also want to invite you to be part of something incredible that is starting this week. From Thursday evening, we are starting a teaching series looking at the Gospel of John. And it's going to be taught by the wonderfully talented and amazingly gifted Claire Porter. And Claire is a great Bible teacher who carries a gift to communicate with such clarity God's word and so I want to encourage you you can join this online course today by emailing us at office at life church.co.uk and we'll get you signed up for that course it's completely free and one of the best things about the fact that it's online is that if you can't make a particular session or any of the sessions you can watch the videos back we'll also be providing comprehensive notes for you as well so it's a great way to spend this time wisely and get connected with God's word at a deeper level. Just before I hand over to James who's going to bring today's message to us in our series Locked Down But Not Locked In, I want to take this opportunity to invite you to partner with us at Life Church as we seek to see God's kingdom advance in this location across our nation and around the world as well. One of the things that strikes me about the early church is that it's characterised by an incredible generosity. You don't have to go far through the book of Acts to start seeing that generosity in action such as when believers sell property that they have to provide for those who are in need. And I'm struck by a story of Peter and John as they enter into the temple. They are confronted by a beggar who's looking for some money. And Peter turns to the beggar and says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And this incredible miracle takes place where this man who's been lame is healed and restored and goes away leaping and jumping and praising God. It's a wonderful story of generosity in action. And for us as a church, we are seeking to be people who are characterised by that same generosity. And it's a generosity that understands that we can be generous with whatever we've been given, whether that's money, whether that's time, whether that's our attention, our energy and our effort. We can be generous with what we have. And so I want to encourage you today to cultivate that generous heart inside of yourself. And one of the ways you can choose to do that is in your finances. So coming up on the screen right now, you will see a couple of ways you can choose to give to us as a church and partner with us as we seek to see God's kingdom advance in this location and around the world. We're so grateful for those who give faithfully into the church. We can't do anything without you. We are solely funded by what people choose to give to us. And so we want to say a thank you to you for partnering with us during this time. Now I'd like to hand over to James who's going to continue our series today. Really looking forward to what you're sharing with us today, James. 
I hope that we are all blessed by what you bring in Jesus' name. Good morning, church. It's been a really funny week, hasn't it? We've had the wonderful high of the news about Colonel Tom Moore, who celebrated his 100th birthday, this really inspirational man who walked laps of his garden to raise money for charity. We've also had the really sad news within church that our good friend Maureen Drake went to be with Jesus on Wednesday night. It was really, really sad to hear about that. And many of you who knew Maureen will know that she was a wonderful lady with a real smile and a great sense of humour. And the two things that really unite these two people are an incredible attitude. Both of them had an amazing attitude. Maureen really loved Jesus and they both she and Colonel Tom Moore are people who were really inspirational and they show really that attitude is everything and that's what we want to help you see one of the things we want to help you see in this series lockdown but not locked in we want to help to speak into the current situation help you see what's possible rather than what's impossible we also want to help you see that this time of incubation is in fact preparation for elevation I believe that we can choose the future that every single one of us walk into. Many people in scripture were limited by one thing or another, whether it was their environment or something physical or psychological or even spiritual about them, but so many of them managed to achieve great things for God despite these limitations that they suffered. We're going to be picking up on a number of these examples as we already have done in this series and it's a great pleasure for me today to share about one of my spiritual heroes, King David. He wasn't always a king, in fact he was once the lowest of the low, but he was faithful from early on in his life and when God called him, he answered. He wasn't infallible, but he went on to be Israel's greatest ever king. He got lots of things wrong but he got some key things right as well. I think a great equation for King David's attitude is this, attitude plus decisions equals altitude. Attitude plus great decisions makes altitude. Someone once said that your attitude determines your altitude. I want to encourage you to think about that this week. And I'm just gonna talk about three things that I think really demonstrate interesting things that we can learn about David's life at this time when we're thinking about being on lockdown but not being locked in. Firstly, if you read three bits of, or four bits of scripture I'm going to refer to, you'll be able to see the three, three really important lessons from David's life. I'm not going to talk about when he slayed Goliath, maybe that'll be for another time, but I want to talk about three or, or four key bits of scripture. Firstly, I want to talk about something from 1 Samuel 16, 1 to 13, and it's this. David's lowly position did not lock him out of a kingly destiny. David's lowly position did not lock him out of a kingly destiny. If you read that piece of scripture from 1 Samuel 16 onwards, you will see that God, by now in the story of Israel, which you may be familiar with, if you're not, I encourage you in this time to get reading your Bible and get really familiar with it. God had rejected Saul as king. And he said this to Samuel in 1 Samuel 16 verse 1. He said, how long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. The picture here is of a simple shepherd boy that, that Samuel goes on to find. A simple shepherd boy. And that picture foreshadows Jesus, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. Back then, the shepherd, the position of a shepherd was an extremely low one. But David was dutiful in all that he did. Here I think we see a picture of Jesus, the king who comes not to be served, but to serve. I believe that service rather than self-satisfaction should mark our lives as Christians. David learned essential lessons in the shepherding years, says the American preacher Paddock Van Zyl. Two of the lessons which would prove invaluable later on in his life, were his trusting God completely in all circumstances and worshipping God ensures 
victory. He had, had he not been a lowly shepherd, he would not have been anointed king. David's lowly position did not lock him out of a kingly destiny. Secondly, if you move a little bit further in the, in the story to the next kind of act, you will see in Samuel 16, verse 14 to 23, a really interesting next part of the story. So we've seen that David's lowly position did not lock him out of a kingly destiny. But next, I want to suggest to you that David's kingly destiny did not mean he was locked out of lowly necessities. David's kingly destiny did not mean he was locked out of lowly necessities. 1 Samuel 16, 21 to 23 says this. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are, all, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with fine health and had a fine appearance with handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint this one. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And, and from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. It's always struck me that the next thing that we read in the story after David's anointing as king is that he then goes on into another, yet another place of service. This shows two things among others. Firstly, that service is all about preparation for the road ahead, as well as being a necessity that should mark our lives all the time as Christians. And secondly, that service is about self-sacrifice for the needs of others. Even though King Saul did evil, even though he became an evil king, David obediently served him because the Lord had instructed him to. Even though David had a kingly destiny, he knew that for now he needed to fulfil the initial mandate of serving the current king. A tip I have here for inspiring leaders is that once you're in the hot seat, that's exactly what it is. It's hot. Don't wish for it to come quicker than it should. Wait for God's timing because that is everything. Sometimes as Christians, we can get so caught up in our destiny that we forget the importance of present reality. A prophetic word or a destiny isn't meant to be an ornament or something to boast about. It's meant to be a weapon. Where are you in all of this? David's kingly destiny did not mean he was locked out of lowly necessities. And thirdly and finally, if you read from 2 Samuel verse 11 onwards and also Psalm 51, you will see this. David's sin did not lock him out of God's blessings and promises and destiny. David's sin did not lock him out of God's blessings, promises and destiny. You see, if you read the story of David, and indeed the story of all the kings of Israel, you will see that David, David's reign was a good one. David was the greatest of all of Israel's kings, but he wasn't without fault. He wasn't always obedient to God's law. His family, if you look at it, was a bit of a mess. And his decisions weren't always wise ones. Did you know that one day David was on top of the roof of his house and he surveyed the houses around him and he allowed his eyes to wander to the beautiful Bathsheba? He went on to commit adultery with Bathsheba. She was a married woman. And he had, David, King David, had her husband, who was also his friend, Uriah the Hittite, murdered. That's pretty bad. We often think of David as such a, an amazing king, and yet he did wrong here. The important thing is that David soon recognised his sin. If you read Psalm 51, you will see that this is the psalm that David wrote it was kind of a, a moment between him and God that we can listen in on, that we can read in ourselves. And he begins it like this. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. 
A man called Alan Redpath once said this. He said, David knew that all the question marks of his life were in the hand of God. He knew it was impossible to be in God's hand and in the enemy's hand at the same time. The gloom begins to disappear and the fear departs as faith emerges in glorious triumph. This man is rising out of his testing and adversity to learn to put his utter dependence on the Lord. You see, David was not without sin and it's a great comfort to us in our frail and weak selves to know that a man as great as David did worse than probably any of us will ever do. Even if you did do as bad as King David ever did, then know that there is forgiveness in Christ Jesus when you come to him with a repentant heart. God even went on, despite David's unfaithfulness, to form a priestly line forever through Jesus, despite all that David did wrong. Jesus was David's bloodline descendant. We'll put the Bible references for the fulfilment of God's promises as we listen today. Why David? Why is he such a great hero? Why did David go on to become Israel's greatest king? Why did God choose David? Why was David locked down but not locked in? Well, because God is gracious, but also because David responds to God's grace and God's mercy with love and obedience and with a recognition of his mistakes and his shortcomings. David repents, he turns to the Lord to line himself up with God's way of thinking. David, great as he was though, still leaves us yearning, still leaves us yearning for something better and he should leave us yearning for something better. He was a decent shepherd, he was a true king of his people, but his shortcomings means that we need someone better. We needed a good shepherd and a perfect king. See, Jesus talked a lot about the kingdom of God. And most of all, he said that the kingdom of, a, of God is a place where Jesus reigns as king. And Jesus is that king that David never could be. See, David was a good start, but Jesus is the one who makes up for all the things that David never could. Because while David was a good shepherd, a decent shepherd and a good king, Jesus is the perfect shepherd and the truest king there could ever be. And I urge you today to make him the good shepherd who could lead you on the road of your life and the king who could reign in your life forever more, for all eternity, to make him king of your life today. Where David, the best king Israel ever had, failed, Jesus mightily prevailed. Jesus is the king who perfectly trusted and obeyed his father. He never gave into one single temptation. He never took advantage of others like David did. Jesus never did harm to his people, but he was and still remains loyal to them. His decisions are always wise. They're always true and they're always for the good of those that he loves. Jesus does not oppress his people. He does not oppress the people of his kingdom, but he always seeks to work for our good. Jesus leads us with royal power to protect us while willingly laying down his life as a servant king to save us. Christ Jesus is not a king who keeps his subjects at a distance. Oh no, he welcomes us into his very presence with arms outstretched and with ultimate joy. And best of all, he is the Prince of Peace who tears down hostility between God and between man and between man and his enemies. Jesus is the hero we need in this broken world that is full of hate and full of pestilence and full of trouble. The righteous branch of David is our wise king. He sits on his throne and he pours out peace into our anxious hearts and he assures us of eternity with him. And that eternity, that time he holds in his hands forever. I urge you friends today, even in the middle of this coronavirus, God has got it all in hand and I encourage you to trust him today.
Let's pray together. Father, thank you for King David, but thank you for Jesus who shows us just how perfect a true shepherd and a great king, the greatest king of kings could ever be. I pray, Lord, for your people that you will help us to trust you afresh today. Lord, I pray that for many of us, we will make Jesus the Lord of our lives today, either for the first time or just as a recommitment to you. Father, I pray that you will help us to trust you afresh. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless. Take care. It's been a wonderful pleasure to be with you today.